All right, now the, the subject matter that I'm going to be preaching on this morning is in regards to one word, and that word is repent. And specifically what I'm going to be covering this morning is repentance and salvation. What part does set repentance have with salvation? And what I'm going to be preaching against and showing you this morning is that there's a lot of people these days that are teaching that you must repent from your sins or repent of your sins in order to be saved. This is very common. This is, this is, a, this is a, a gospel that's preached and taught by Ray Comfort, by um, Paul Washer, by a, lot, by a whole bunch of people. Those are a couple of big names that are out there. There are lots of people, though. I mean, there's Baptist churches that teach this. There's all kinds of churches that teach this, and it's a false gospel. It's not true. Now, we have to define our terms and be very clear about it. Because I'll tell you this, I have run into people out soul winning when I ask them how they're saved, and they'll throw out that answer, oh, you got to repent of your sins to be saved, and, you know, believe on Jesus and, you know, repent of your sins. And when I start questioning them and digging deeper into what they actually believe, I've run into plenty of people that do, well, no, no, it's just faith. Like, it's, it's the faith that saves you. It's believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. That's what the Bible says. And when I ask people, you know, sometimes they'll, they'll have it clear and straight down, but they throw that term out because it's something that gets repeated so many times that when you hear something over and over again, you have a tendency just to repeat it without even really thinking about it. You can just repeat things. So people say, oh, you got to repent of your sins to be saved. And you hear it from Pope, you got to repent of your sins to be saved. Pretty soon people are just going to start saying, you got to repent of your sins to be saved without even thinking about what that means. Now, and I'm... Try to stay with me. I'm going to try to be as clear as possible. We have to start off getting a good definition of our words. Dictionaries are not always completely infallible. and They're never completely infallible. Put it that way. Dictionaries are words that are defined that are made by man. But they're not the be-all and end-all. Words have a, in, throughout history can change meaning over time. Keep in mind, we're reading a book that was translated into English in the 1600s. In 1611, it was derived from, you know, used other works that was, that was, you know, translated even earlier than that. 1500s, 1600s, okay. Words have changed meanings throughout time. You know, the, the, it's, it's just, it's the, the natural evolution, if you will, of language. You know, people start to use words even incorrectly, but after a while, if everybody's using the word that way, that becomes the meaning of the word, Okay. Now, the dictionary definition of the word repent, I don't have it down here. They'll even put in there, turn from your sins. Okay? First of all, the word repent itself has nothing inherently to do with sin. That is a lie. The word repent. Now, if you say repent of your sins, okay, now you're, you're including sins in with the, def, you know, with the usage of the word. Right? But the word by itself, repent, literally means, and, and we're going we're gonna to go through every occurrence of repent, repented, repentance in the New Testament and a few from the Old Testament. I'm gonna, this is going to be a two-part sermon. Okay, I'm going to preach this morning. Anti, there's, there's a lot of material to cover. To, and, and it's important because this doctrine is huge today and we need to make sure we have the proper biblical understanding of this because it's so widely taught, but it's taught incorrectly. The definition of our words need to be, we need to, to take context into consideration when we're looking at what a word means, right? And some words, and, it's, and repent is one of these words, it has a, you know, variations of the meaning depending on the context in which it's used. So in some cases, when you use the word repent, it can be referring to salvation. In some cases, it could be referring to having great sorrow. In some, you know, but but you have to get it clear from the context that it's used in. Now, the, the definition literally for repent is to turn or to change or to rethink. And I did some study on the etymology of this. Even the etymology, you know, you might find someone saying, "Oh, yeah, this is settled. This is exactly where it came from." But there's other people that say different. When you start going back, because the etymology, what that is, the etymology is just where where a word 
comes from, where it was derived from, you know, when uh, the English language came about, you know, it, it, it kind of came from Germanic and Latin, you know, and there's, there's other words. You could go to the root of a word and find another language that it, that it kind of stemmed from and, and was, was born from into our language. So the word repent, I have seen different things, and I believe, and, and this, this lines up with scripture. There's a word penser, which means like to think, which is which I believe that's the root of repent. You think of penser and pent, and you think if someone's real pensive, they're thoughtful, they're th you know they think about things a lot. That's what the word pensive means. So repent would be to think again. And as we go through all of the scriptural references, you should see that that makes perfect sense. Um, with what we're talking, I'll read for you from Jeremiah 18, 8. Jeremiah 18, 8, the Bible says, If that nation against whom I have pronounced turn from their evil, and this is the Lord speaking, right? This is the word of the Lord. If that nation turns from their evil, if they stop doing evil deeds and evil works, he says, I will repent of the evil that I thought to do unto them. Now, if the word repent inherently meant turn from sin, does God have sin? No. But we see in Jeremiah 18 and in many places, and actually, when you look up whoever is doing the repenting in the Bible, God is doing the repenting more times than anybody else in the whole Bible. And you'll find that pretty much in the Old Testament, but when you go through, and that's, that's see, there's so much on this topic, and I don't want to get too off on too many rabbit trails, but the, the new versions of the Bible, what they're changing in the, in the Old Testament, they're removing all of those, re all the words repent, so that this doctrine can be pushed of you have to repent, meaning to turn from your sins to be saved. Because if someone reads the Bible and says, wait a minute, if God's repenting, re the word repent can't just mean turn from your sins. Because God doesn't have sins. I mean, people aren't that stupid just to think that, oh, well, if God's repenting, then he must have had sin. Nobody's going to think that. So when you start seeing the Lord repenting in different places, that's going to change your belief or you make you question, well, wait a minute, what does this word repent even really mean? Because it doesn't mean turn from your sins. We are going to see in context where there are plenty of scriptural references that refer to turning from wickedness, repenting from wickedness and sins and things like that, that is in the Bible. But what I'm going to show you as well is that those references are not talking about our salvation, the salvation of our souls. But I digress. Let's look at, I'm going to read for you further from Jeremiah 18. So we see God repenting. And that word evil, that doesn't mean sin necessarily it could but not always evil is a word and again words have a tendency to change over time and we get this concept of what a word means evil means bringing harm to somebody so when god said he's going to repent of the evil god judges people god judges nations when they start doing wickedly he brings in judgment and that judgment oftentimes is people losing their lives and people having all kinds of bad things happen as a result of their sin, God causes that to happen. God is bringing evil upon, it, upon the people without sinning because he's righteous, because he's judging them. Now, when we do evil to someone else, usually it is a sin. Usually. Right? I mean, if you're going and I'm, if I just go up to Brother Sebastian, just clog him in the face, I'm doing evil to him because I'm inflicting harm. I'm, I'm hurting him. But that's what that word evil means. I don't want to get too caught up in evil because this is about repent, right? So God says, I will repent of the evil that I thought to do unto them. And at what instant I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to build and to plant it. If it do evil in my sight that it obey not my voice, then I will repent of the good wherewith I said I would benefit them. So we see God repenting either of evil or of good. He's saying, okay, if they stop doing their wickedness and they start doing what's right, I will repent of the evil, the bad things I was going to do to them. But if they start doing bad and just and get into sin and do bad things, he said, okay, well, all the blessings, all the good that I was going to do to them, I'm going to repent of that. So you see, right off the bat here with Jeremiah 18, you're going to see that repenting is turning. He's changing his mind. He says, I was going to do, when they're sinning, I was going to do real bad to them. 
because they're sinning, because I'm going to bring judgment to, to bring judgment upon their sins. But now they've, you know, they're doing right. They've gotten right with me, so I'm going to change my mind and I'm not going to do what I was planning on doing to them. That's what that word repent means. He says in the same manner, they've been doing real good, a whole nation, they've been doing great, like the United States of America, how about that? God has been blessing this country because by and large it's been a very Christian nation built on Christian fundamentals and, and Bible principles, biblical principles, you know, our laws, the, the culture. But now, we've strayed from that. We've steered from that. So God was planning on doing good and continuing to bless because we've been doing righteously overall, by and large. But now he's going to say, well, I'm changing my mind. I'm not going to give you, I'm not going to bless you anymore because you're sinning. So this is, this is a good, this is what the word repent really means. I mean, that, that's what it is. It's changing and turning of, and, and, and changing what you think, what you believe, what you're going to do. That is repent. Now, we started off in Genesis chapter 6. This is the first time that the word repent is even used in the Bible. Now, a lot of people, I've heard it said, and it's a pretty good rule of thumb, but this is not scripture truth. When you want to know what a word means in the Bible, go to the, the first time that it's used, and normally the Bible will define itself. Okay, it's a rule of firsts, but again, with, with some things, we got to take it in total. You, with everything, you have to take it in total context and, and look at all the usages. But when we go to Genesis chapter 6, we're going to see here that there is grief involved with the repenting. And honestly, when you look at re the, all the different uh, usages of repentance, there is very, very many times grief found in association with repenting. But not always. That, that verse that we read in Jer Jeremiah 18, that God just says, well, the, the good I was going to do to you, I'm not going to do it anymore. Or the bad I was going to do to you, I'm not, I'm not going to do the bad anymore. Why would God be sad or have grief over not inflicting judgment on people who are doing wickedly because they're doing right? There is no grief at all associated with that repentance, with God saying, okay, you're doing what's right now. Man, I wish I could just strike you dead, but no. There's no grief or sorrow over God changing his mind in that aspect. So we need to get everything in context, but we're going to see in Genesis chapter 6, and this is because I've, I've heard lots of arguments to, to, for people trying to justify essentially a works-based salvation. And that's because if you have to repent of your sins to be saved, that means you have to turn from your sins. What does that mean? If you turn from your sins, what does that mean? It means you're not going to sin anymore. Does it mean anything else? If, if you say, I'm going to turn from my sins, but I'm still going to keep sinning, can you really say you've turned from your sins? I mean, can you? I, I, I don't see it. Now, they'll say, and, and, oh, well, no, you at least have to try. Well, where does the Bible say you just have to try to not sin and you're okay? And that's what salvation is. It doesn't. Right? God is a God of, these are my commandments, you follow all of my commandments. And if you don't, there's a punishment. That's the way God is. Now God also has his mercy and long-suffering and his grace, which is why our salvation is a free gift. You receive it one time through faith in Jesus Christ and all of your sins are forgiven. But he doesn't require you to just turn from all. Now, is turning from your sins a good thing? Absolutely. Absolutely. We should be repenting of our sins on a daily basis. I believe in repentance and repenting. I think it's a great thing. I think it's something everybody should do. But what I'm telling you is that that is not a part of our salvation. Genesis 6, look down at verse number 5. So this is after God, you know, real shortly after creation and man started to multiply on the earth. It says in verse 5, And God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth. And that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth. So when it says he repented the Lord, he basically changed his mind that he's kind of saying, like, I wish I never even made man. Because look at what they've turned out to be. Look at how wicked these become. And, and this is what, in the context, 
it, it, and it says, and it grieved him at his heart. He was sorry that he had made man. I'm sorry that I even did this because now they've just become really wicked and there's all this violence and all this stuff going on. That's not what I intended when I made him. I kind of wish that I hadn't even made man. When it says it repented Lord, this, that's what it's saying. Verse 7 says, And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, and creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. Now, if that was the only place that we ever turned to in the Bible, you can say, oh yeah, well, well grief and, and repentance go hand in hand because God was sorry about it. And you could say, and, and you could see in the usage of the word repented there, it, it has a, it's very heavily tied in with being sorry for something that was done. Absolutely. And this isn't the only place that ties in repentance with this kind of great sorrow and grieving and mourning and, and, and sadness over something that was done. But this is not the only way that the word is used. This is not the only definition. We need to make sure that we're very clear that we're looking in context what we're looking at to, in order to understand what the word means and what it's referring to. Now, there still is this change of mind going on about him not wanting to have made man. But re it repented him. It's a past tense thing. It, he can't change his mind. He already did it, right? Right? So he would like to have changed his mind, but he, but he can't do it. So this is what that, what that means. Now let's go to, um, well, I'll read for you from Exodus 32. Go to Matthew chapter 3, because we're going to get, I don't, I'm really spending a little bit more time than I want to, even on some of these Old Testament passages. Turn to Matthew chapter 3. I'll read for you from Exodus 32, because here's another, another reference with the word repent that I don't think has anything to do with sorrow. Exodus 32, 11 says, And Moses besought the Lord his God and said, Lord, why doth thy wrath wax hot against thy people, which thou hast brought forth out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Wherefore should the Egyptians speak and say, For mischief he did he bring them out to slay them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from thy fierce wrath and repent of this evil against thy people. So Moses is pleading with God. And he's saying, God, why are you so angry with this people to destroy them? Why are you so mad? He's saying, if you destroy this people, the Egyptians are going to hear about it. And they're going to say, well, the only reason God even brought them out of Egypt was so that he can destroy them in the wilderness. Right? And they're going to get this false idea in their head that, oh, God just wanted to kill them over here so that they won't understand how wicked they were and that God was delivering his people and that this is his people, you know. So Moses is trying to plead with God and saying, God, you know, turn from your fierce wrath. So he's using this reasoning with God and, and saying and asking God to repent of destroying the people. Now, I don't see anything about sorrow in there, about God being sad or grieving that this people is so wicked or that, you know, the Egyptians might think something different. There's no sorrow in that verse. It's just saying he's asking him to change his mind, not to do evil against this people. And he's using, he's using a good argument to do so. Saying, well, this is what the people are going to say if you do that. So, so let's not do that. There's over 100 usages of the, word by, of the word repent in one form or another in the Bible. Over 100. Most of them are not dealing with the salvation of our souls at all. Now, the few references that we saw here in Genesis, that had nothing to do with salvation at all. The word repent was in there, nothing to do with salvation. The first reference I turned to, Genesis or Jeremiah 18, Nothing to do with salvation. It's God's judgment coming upon a nation or upon a land. And actually, the, the majority of the times you're going to find the word repent used in the Old Testament, it is going to have to do with that judgment and that type of repentance. And I preached an entire sermon called The Salvation of a Nation. And this is where a lot of people get confused in their doctrine. In order for a nation to be saved, it requires the nation doing good works. To be saved from God's judgment. But an individual, you or me or him, any, any one of us, for us, for our souls to be saved eternally, it has nothing to do with our works. 
as an entire group of people, the, the whole town of Prescott Valley, if, if God's judgment were going to come upon our town for whatever reason because we're so wicked, in order for us to be saved as a town, as a whole, we would need to do good. We would need to do what's right and, and be obeying God and His laws. But that's not, the town doesn't have a soul. The individual has a soul. And the salvation of our soul has to do with our acceptance of Jesus Christ. Okay? So when you, again, keep that in mind when you're looking at repentance. They'll say, you know, you know people repenting of their, you know, their evil deeds and their bad works. And that's why they're not going to have judgment. And people say, see, you have to not do, do bad things in order to be saved. No. Not, not, our, not our individual souls. That's talking about a group of people. Now, in context, we're going to go through the New Testament. Like I said, I don't think we'll have enough time to get through all this this morning. I'm going to, I'm going to do my best to get through this, but I want to be very clear. I want, this to, I want you to have zero doubts about what this word means. And if anybody's going to try to bring up any of see, see, look, the Bible says right here. We're going to look at all the verses in the New Testament. Because, I mean, if we're talking about salvation, I want to focus on salvation. Because that's where the perversion comes from, is when people say you need to turn from your sins or repent of your sins to be saved. You're messing with salvation. Let's see if that's what the Bible really says in the New Testament. Matthew chapter 3. The first time we see it used in the New Testament, Matthew chapter 3, verse number 1. Because people always say, oh, John the Baptist, he preached repentance. Jesus Christ preached repentance. And all this other. They preached, look, Yes, they did preach repentance, but they didn't say you have to turn from your sins to be saved. Matthew chapter 3, verse number 1. In those days came John the Baptist, preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, from the context of this chapter and of this verse, can you know for sure that this is talking about salvation? Repent ye for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And if it is, say, okay, you know what it seems like? He's talking about the kingdom of heaven, so this is probably talking about salvation. Okay, does he say what you have to repent? What you have to change from? What do you have to turn from? Is that found in the context? Does he say, is there any mention of sins? Any mention of wickedness? We'll read a little bit more. Look at verse number three. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. And the same John had his raiment. And this talks about John. So what he said in verse 2, I mean the chapter just continues on. I'm not going to read the entire chapter. Read it later. Look at these later and see if what I'm saying is, oh wait, there's more context here that says something different. Read it for yourself, but there's not. So we see, um, well, we'll, we'll just keep reading. Verse 5. Then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region round about Jordan and were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth therefore fruits, meet for repentance, and think not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father, for I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. Now, I'm going to explain when, when repentance is referring to salvation, every single time there is a change that it's referring to, but the change is simple. It's, it's very easy. Now, how many times have we seen in the Bible when it's referring to eternal life, everlasting life, being saved, salvation, have you seen believe? Right? John 3, 3, for whosoever, uh, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Um, the Bible says, um, you know, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. Very clear verses regarding eternal life, everlasting life, salvation, right? I mean, in the context of these verses, you see these other, these other indicators. This is talking about eternal life. This is talking about salvation, right? And all they're saying is believe. So, in order to be saved, you have to change your mind. You have to think again about what you believe it's going to get you to heaven. 
When I talk to a person and I say, hey, do you know for sure if you die today that you're going to heaven? And they say, yeah. And I go, well, why? Why are you going? Well, I'm a pretty good person. I, I'm pretty good. I don't do anything that bad. Right? Now, can that person continue to believe that way and, still, and go to heaven? No. It sounds to me like they need to think it over again and change their mind about what they believe it takes to be saved. And that's why we show them, the, show them the Scripture, show them all the verses that say, what must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what you have to do. Once they believe on Christ, they've changed what they believe. They say, oh, yeah, now I believe different. Now I'm changing what I believe and I'm believing on Christ. Hey, they've just repented. They've just changed something. They just believed different. They didn't believe on Christ before. They believed in works before. Now they're believing on Christ. And people will say, make this statement, and you hear it, it, you know, there's these cute phrases that churches sit down right now, that churches will throw out there, like, turn from sin to the Savior. And it sounds good. It sounds catchy, right? Oh, yeah, turn from sin to the Savior. Turn, you know, repent from your sins, turn from sin to the Savior. Do you know anyone that's trusting in their sins to go to heaven? Because that's why I've heard that, that, that phrase doesn't make any sense. If you're changing, well, I've, you know, I'm, all the bad things I've done, that's going to get me into heaven. That's what I'm relying on. No, you're not, turn, you're, not, you're not changing, this is what I was believing in to be saved, and now I'm believing in Jesus. You could turn from your idols, from your false gods. You'll find that in the Bible. We'll see that as we go through these verses. People repenting when, when the Apostle Paul is preaching to the Gentiles, hey, you need to repent of your false idols. Repent of these false gods. You have these, these Greek gods, these Roman gods, these, you know, all these images and these people that you worship. Hey, you need to repent. You need to change. You can't be believing in Zeus or in any of these other false gods and be saved. They can't save you. They'll go into all the detail. Look, it's a piece of wood and you, you've covered it with, with gold and silver and, and precious stones, but it's, it's, it's inanimate. It's not a god. When people can steal your God, that's not a God. We saw that in Genesis this week. That's not God. You say you need, to, you need to repent. You need to change. Okay? So, we see in Matthew 3, John the Baptist preaching, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. People do need to repent. The Jews, for example, many of them believed that because they were physical seeds of Abraham, because of their physical birth, that they were automatically God's people and they were saved by virtue of being born through that lineage. Which is why he says, because people will try to, to come to this specific passage and say, see, John said, bring forth therefore fruits meet for repentance in, in verse number 8 of uh, Matthew 3. Who is he speaking to? Well, verse 7 says, But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come, bring forth therefore fruits meet for repentance. John's baptizing people. The Pharisees and Sadducees show up, and he's saying, What are you doing here? Right? And he's saying, look, if you need to be, if you want to be baptized, you better bring forth fruits, meat for repentance, being like, you need to show me that you really do believe. He wasn't saying that to everybody. But the Pharisees and the Sadducees already were, were, were in, steeped in a false religion and were worshiping a false god. And they did not, they were not saved. They were trusting, in, and that's why he says that in verse 9, and think not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father. He's saying, and, and you better not be trusting that just because you're of the seed, physical seed of Abraham, that all of a sudden you're automatically saved. He says, for I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children of Abraham. That means nothing. If you really believe this, I want to see that you believe this. To them, because they were teaching a false gospel. They believed in a false god. That's what he was saying to them. And that makes sense. I'm not going to just baptize someone like that's completely 
teaching and preaching a false gospel and a false thing unless I'm pretty confident that, well, you know, do you really believe what I'm saying here? Are you still holding to Abraham? Are you still holding to these other things? Versus, a, you know, someone else who's just your average person who's putting their faith on Christ. I mean, hey, they, they make the proclamation with the mouth. Okay, yeah, you're, you know, we're not going to... You think of Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. He didn't tell the Ethiopian eunuch to bring forth fruits, meat for repentance before he could get baptized. They came across a certain water. The eunuch said, see, here's water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? He said, why can't I be baptized? There's water right there. He said, well, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And then he baptized him. That was good enough. And you know what? For most people, that's, that is good enough. When someone confesses with their mouth the Lord Jesus and believes in their heart that God has raised him from the dead, they're saved. And they get baptized right away. But these false teachers and prophets, he's saying, wait, 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 I want to see, I want to, you know, you guys are sneaky and tricky and you are, you know, they're already used to telling people what they want to hear. So he wants to make sure they're not just saying something to go along with it for a show to those specific people, to the Pharisees and the Sadducees. This is not, he's not preaching, and we're going to see this in a few minutes too. I'm going to get into a little bit more in depth about what John was preaching. There's very crystal clear, you know, I'll just do it right now. Because we are covering every single reference of repent in the New Testament. So John's repentance, Mark 1.4 is another place. Stay, stay in Matthew. I'm going to read these for you because a lot of these are going to be repeats because in the Gospels you have, you have you know, duplication of stories. It's going to be the same thing said. Just in, but I'm trying to be thorough. Okay, I, well, we're going to go through it all. I'm going to go through a little bit more quickly through some of these. But um, stay in Matthew. Go to Matthew, or go to Matthew chapter 4. It's the next place we're going to look at. But in Mark 1, 4, in Mark 1, 4 uh, the Bible says, John did baptize in the wilderness and preach the baptism of repentance for the remission of sin. So is John preaching repentance? Yes. But does he say you have to re the, the repentance of sin for salvation? No. It says for the remission of sins. So for the taking away of sins. He was preaching the baptism of repentance. Luke 3.3 3, And he came into all the country about Jordan preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. So there's that phrase again. The baptism of repentance. Right? Baptism of repentance. Luke 3.8 Bring forth, therefore, fruits worthy of repentance, and begin not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father, for I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. Same thing we read in Matthew. And then in Acts, actually turn if you would to Acts 19, because I want you to see this. You have to see this verse. When people talk about John, John the Baptist, and him preaching repentance, and it's all through the Bible, and, and okay, we're seeing a bunch of verses here that talk about John and preaching repentance, right? The baptism of repentance. Acts 13, 24 says, When John had first preached before his coming the baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel. Right? John preached, he preached repentance. No doubt about it. But what was he actually preaching when he preached about the baptism of repentance? What did he mean? What did he mean by the baptism of repentance? Acts chapter 19, verse 4 gives us the answer. Unequivocally, what is he talking about? Acts 19, verse number 4. Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. The Apostle Paul says, yes, John verily, it truly, he came and he baptized the baptism of repentance. And what was he preaching? What was that message, the baptism of repentance? Acts 19.4, saying unto the people that they should believe on him, that should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. The baptism of repentance that John preached was that people needed to believe on Christ Jesus. That's it. So don't let people say, you know, oh, John's, you know, he preached this and you, you need to repent and all this other stuff. Look, understand what the word repent means and we have a very, very clear, all those verses I just read about John and, and, his, and, his, preaching of bap, and, his, and his preaching of repentance all summarized in Acts 19.4. The answer's right there. Let's go back to Matthew. 
Because basically we see Jesus say the same exact thing in Matthew 4. Now I have most of these in order so we could keep moving forward through the Bible. I'm going to try to be as quick as possible. Try to keep up, um, but if you don't, that's fine. I can give you notes after the sermon if you want to have these all written down or just write them down for later to look them up. But I encourage you to look them up because I don't have time to, to read the entire chapters that we're reading. Sometimes I'm only going to be reading one verse. Look them up and look at the context. Now, I feel like I'm including enough to get the context of what we're reading about. There's some verses where I have longer sections. But determine that for yourself. Don't just trust what I'm saying. Matthew chapter 4, Jesus Christ said, He says, From that time Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Matthew 4, 17. That's the same exact thing that John said. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, again, Void of the words salvation, eternal life, hell, saved, everlasting life. All these things referring to salvation. But you could say, okay, well, the kingdom of heaven is there. Fair enough. That's fine. That's, that's legitimate. Okay, but what are you repenting of? He's not clear. He's not saying what you have to repent of. In the context of this verse, he just says repent. Right? So it must be understood what he's talking about. And what I'm trying to prove is that it's not talking about sin. Because sin is always specifically mentioned in the context if that's what it, what it has to do with. Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9, verse 11. And we don't even say, and the thing about sorrow too, because people are always trying to say, oh, repentance always means, and the dictionary definition of, of repentance has sorrow in it like almost every single time. When you look at Oxford, you look, you look at all these different dictionaries, sorrow, grief, sorrow. And this is why I'm saying you can't always trust the dictionary definition. Right? And especially in a biblical context. And that, think, about, think about any word you look up in a dictionary. Is there ever usually just one definition? No. There's one, two, three, four, five, sometimes six. I mean, you'll have multiple definitions of words. That is common. I mean, anyone who's looked up words in a dictionary knows that to be true. There is never just one definition of a word which is why context is so important. But let's keep going here. Ma uh, Matthew 9, look at verse 11. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto his disciples, Why eateth your master with publicans and sinners? But when Jesus heard that, he said unto them, They that be whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. But go ye and learn what that meaneth. I will have mercy and not sacrifice. For I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Now, there's the word repentance, right? He's saying, look, I came to call sinners to repentance. Is he clearly just talking about salvation here? Did Jesus Christ, I mean, he came to, as the savior of the world and to save the world from their sins, but didn't he also preach a message of not sinning? Do you remember when the woman was taken in adultery? And they were going to throw, you know, and he said, he that is without sin among you cast the first stone, right? They all ended up leaving, and then the woman was there left alone. And what did he say to that woman that was left alone? He says, where are your accusers, right? Has no man condemn thee? He says, well, neither do I. He says, go and sin no more. Now, is he saying that so she could go to heaven? No. She's not saying go and sin no more to be saved, but did Jesus only ever, only just preach about salvation every single time he opened up his mouth? No. He preached holiness and righteous living. So for him to say, I, I'm not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Okay, first of all, you can look, if you want to look at that and say, well, yeah, the sinners need to change from their sin. Yeah, they do. But it doesn't say that you have to do that to be saved. Or you can say, well, the righteous are those who have already put their faith in Christ and they've already been washed and that's why they're righteous. So he came to call those who haven't been washed. So the repentance then could be referring to their belief on Christ. So what I'm saying is there's a, there's, there's a couple different ways you can look at this verse. 
but I can, you cannot point to this verse and say, see, you have to turn from your sins in order to be saved. Because the context doesn't, it doesn't say that there. It just simply isn't there. Matthew chapter 11, verse number 20, Matthew 11. Then began he to upbraid the cities wherein most of his mighty works were done because they repented not. Now look, what is he talking about? Cities. Remember what I mentioned earlier about the salvation of a city or of a town or of a nation? Then began he to upbraid the cities wherein most of his mighty works were done because they repented not. Woe unto thee, Chorazin! Woe unto thee, Bethsaida! For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the day of judgment than for you. And thou, Capernaum, which art exalted unto heaven shall be brought down to hell. For if the mighty works which have been done in thee had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. The men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonas. And behold, a greater than Jonas is here. So here we see more repentance, but he's talking about cities. He says even Sodom would still be here right now. Because did Sodom, did Sodom exist? No, it was wiped off the face of the earth. God destroyed it with fire and brimstone. It's not just because the people died. The whole city is, is, is destroyed and, and has just become ashes and was never rebuilt. To this day, Sodom is just destroyed. And that's what he's saying. Look, now, and, and what he's trying to do is provoke him and say, look, Jesus Christ has come doing a lot of miracles, a lot of good works, and a lot of proof, a lot of evidence showing you, look, look at all this stuff that I'm doing. If these great works were done back then, you know, those people would have changed and, and, and started doing right and living right and doing all this other stuff. But the city would not have been destroyed. And he's saying, you, the, you know, the, by and large, the cities aren't accepting it. And, um, the cities were destroyed. Turn, if you would, to Matthew 21. Matthew 21. And verse number 28. Matthew 21, 28 says, But what think ye? A certain man had two sons, and he came to the first and said, Son, go work today in my vineyard. He answered and said, I will not, but afterward he repented and went. So again, he changed his mind. He said, okay. He's like, yeah, I'm not going to do that, Dad. But then he changed his mind and said, you know what? I think I should just go and do that. So he changed his mind and he went and he did it. Verse 30, and, it came, and he came to the second and said, likewise. And he answered and said, I go, sir, and went not. Whether of them twain did the will of his father, meaning which, which one of the two sons did what his father wanted him to do? They say unto him the first. Jesus saith unto them, Verily I say unto you that the publicans and the harlots go into the kingdom of God before you. So now he's saying, okay, these publicans and these harlots, these sinners are going to heaven before you. Now, does he say the people that used to be publicans and harlots? No. These publicans and harlots go into the kingdom of God before you. Why? Verse 32. For John came unto you in the way of righteousness, and ye believed him not. So why are they going to go to heaven and you're not? Because you didn't believe John. Let's keep reading. But the publicans and the harlots believed him. And ye, when ye had seen it, seen what? Seen that the publicans and harlots believed John. That they believed what he was saying. They put their faith on the Lord. When they saw that, he says, when, when you guys saw that, you repented not afterward that ye might believe him. Do you see how clearly it's saying the repentance here is that they needed to believe? I mean, their repentance that they needed, the, after they saw, look, first, they didn't believe John. When John came to them preaching, you know, these Pharisees and these Sadducees and these other people, they didn't believe John. They didn't believe him. But then other people did, though. Publicans, harlots, people you might consider the low class, right? The, 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 the despised people, the sinners. 
They received John's message. They believed him. And what he's saying, Jesus is, is rebuking them, saying, look, you saw these people believe on John, and you still didn't believe. You still didn't change your mind and believe the message that John was preaching. And that's why you're not going to see the kingdom of God. That's why they are going to go to heaven, and you are not, because they believed. They received the message. He doesn't say the former prostitutes, the former harlots. He says the publicans and, and the harlots and the sinners. Now, should they be changing their life and doing what's right? Absolutely they should. Absolutely they should. But does a person have to in order to go to heaven? No. This is the repentance that we're looking at. Okay, Matthew 27, verse number 3. And this is in regards to salvation, right? I, I, he's talking about going to the kingdom of heaven, and he specifically talks about believing. No mention of they had to turn from their sins to be saved at all. He refers to them as publicans and harlots. Matthew 27, verse number 3. Then Judas, which had betrayed him, when he saw that he was condemned, repented himself and brought again the thirty pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned in that I have betrayed the innocent blood. And they said, What is that to us? See thou to that. And he cast down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. Right? Judas Iscariot. He actually felt bad after he betrayed Jesus Christ. One of the twelve. The thief. What Jesus referred to as a devil. He felt bad about turning Jesus Christ in. And, and the money that they paid him, the blood money they gave him in order to get him arrested... He felt so bad about it. He's like, no, you know, I can't take this. You guys just need to take this. And, and they're like, the, you see to that. Like, like, it's over. It's done with. That's your, you know, the, the deal's over. And then he went and he felt so bad that he killed himself. That's the actual grief and sorrow that he had. And that's the repentance that Judas had. It was a full-on grief and sorrow. And this is what people are going to try to teach you. You need to be so sorry for everything you've ever done and all this other stuff. You know, in order to be saved, you need to go and get repented and turn from all this stuff. Hey, Judas repented himself of what he did to Jesus Christ. But I'll tell you what, Judas went to hell. Judas was not saved even after he felt bad for betraying Jesus Christ because he never put his faith on him because Jesus Christ said he was a devil. He was a son of Belial. That is who he was. He did not get saved later. Jesus Christ said in John 6, verse 70, And Jesus answered them, Have not I chosen you twelve, and one of you is a devil? He knew it. A devil doesn't have salvation. A devil's not going to get saved. They've already become a child of the devil. Just like when we become a child of God, we can never lose our salvation because we're God's child. When you become a child of the devil... That's who you are, and that's who you'll be. And that, you know, Judas was not saved. But he, he did this repentance that people try, try to tell you that you need to do in order to receive salvation. He did that, but he didn't put his faith on Christ, which is the true repentance needed to be saved. Oh, good. We already covered all that. That's John's repentance. Luke chapter 5. And again, this is, you know what, I'll read through. Luke 5. 32, Luke 10, 13, Luke 11, 32. I'm going to read these for you. This is all repeats of what we had already covered in Matthew. Okay, this is the same, the same statements. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance in Luke 5, 32. Luke 10, 13, Woe unto thee, Chorazin! Woe unto thee, Bethsaida! For if the mighty works had been done in Tyre and Sidon, which had been done in you, they had a great while ago repented, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. Luke 11, 32, The men of Nineveh shall rise up in, judgment, in the judgment with this generation and shall condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonas. And behold, a greater than Jonas is here. Um, oh, turn to Luke 13. Luke 13. This is, a, this is a new one. <laughs> yeah, we're going into tonight for sure. <laughs> there's a lot of verses. There, I think there's like 60 verses in the New Testament that, that use the word repent. But I want to cover them all. 
I'm not going to leave any stone unturned here that when we look at these verses. And the whole while, think to yourself, are these verses saying that I have to turn from my sins to be saved? When we see the word repent, is that what it's saying? And even if you find one where you're like, well, it's kind of saying that, right? Like, like if you're sitting there, well, well, maybe this one sort of in a way makes you, I could see where you might think that. How many, think about how many times you're going to be thinking that, if ever, in the context of all of these verses. And in what you already know about the Bible saying about believing on Christ to be saved with no mention. You know, in the book of John, there is zero, men, the, the word repent is not found at all in any form or fashion. The book of John is also the book that claims in John chapter 20 when it says uh, at the end of John chapter 20, and many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples which are not written in this book. But these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. This book of John, the things that are written in this book, is claiming these things are all written so that you can believe on Christ and so that you can have life through his name, that you can have eternal life. Not one mention of the word repent. Not one. And I'll tell you what, when I go out sowing, I use a lot of scripture from the book of John. John is a great book that talks about the deity of Jesus Christ. The, the, just everything, there's so much about Jesus Christ and his salvation and, and the belief and what we need to do to be saved is found in the book of John. Not one time is the word repent found. Interesting. Leslie, can you take her out, please? Elizabeth. And discipline her. Luke 13, verse number 1, Luke 13. There were present at that season some that told him of the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And Jesus answering said unto them, Suppose ye that these Galileans were sinners above all the Galileans because they suffered such things. I tell you, nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Ah! He's saying, so, do you think that these people, what he's saying is, do you think that those, that those Galileans were sinners more than everybody else? Because they suffered such things, because of, it says, because of what Pilate did to them, right? So he's saying these bad things happened to these Galileans, it says, whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. So Pilate came down on these people, did, you know, did bad things to him. So he's, he's asking, Jesus is talking to the people now saying, well, do you think that these Galileans were sinners above all the Galileans? That they were just so much worse because Pilate did these things, because they suffered such things? He says, I tell you, no, nay. But except you repent, ye shall all likewise perish. And people, the, the people who teach us repent of your sins, they love to go to this verse. And he says, or those 18 upon whom the tower in Siloam fell and slew them. Think ye that they were sinners above all men that dwelt in Jerusalem? I tell you, nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. So here he's talking about sinners, he's talking about people doing bad things. And he's saying, well, if you don't repent, then you're, you're going to perish. And people say, see, that word perish, it means he's going to hell. No, the word perish doesn't necessarily, again, context. So when he says, ye shall likewise perish, what does the word likewise mean? It means in the same manner, right? The same way. The same way that they died is the way that you are going to die. So if you don't repent, if you don't do what's right, you're going to die in the same way. Why? Because God could bring judgment on people, right? So this, tower, this big event, this tower falls down on top and kills a bunch of people. He's saying, well, if you don't, I mean, if you don't repent, you're going you're gonna to die. You're going to likewise perish. You're going to die like that too. You're going to die in, in, a, in a horrible way. Not talking about the salvation of our souls. There. Not one time he's talking about the kingdom of heaven. He's not talking about salvation, eternal life, everlasting life, nowhere. But, it, it, I mean, likewise, we, who are already saved, if we start getting into a bunch of sins, we need to repent so that God doesn't strike us dead and bring judgment upon us. I mean, we can die in a horrible way on this earth. It doesn't mean we're not saved. 
But if we start getting into, to, into really bad sins, we're going to need to repent of that or else we're going to die just like, the, just like the unsaved do. You know, in, in, these, in these ways. Just like these Galileans did or just like these other people did. Luke 15. Luke 15, 7 says, I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth more than over ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. Likewise, uh, verse 10 says, Likewise I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. So, hey, it's a, it's a happy thing when a sinner repents. Let's say, if this is talking about repenting is in doing good works. Okay, why wouldn't God and the angels be happy over someone, over a Christian, who was not doing what's right? You have a whole church of people, right? Let's say it says, uh, you know, you got a whole bunch of people. One person starts getting into all kinds of sin and just starts, starts living, doing all kinds of wicked things. But then they get right and get back in with the group and they start doing that which is right again. That's going to cause a lot of joy in heaven. Hey, hey, this guy's back. He's doing what's right now. He's, he's, he's turned from all that wickedness that he was doing and now he's serving the Lord again. Praise God, what a happy time, what a, what a happy event to happen. That's why it says, you know, um, I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth, more than over ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. If you're doing what's right, you don't, you don't need that repentance, right? So he's, he's going to be much happier over someone. Hey, they finally came back. And the reason why I think that that's what this is talking about is because this is followed up immediately by the story of the prodigal son. Immediately, in context, in Luke 15, you read set, verse 7 and 10 that talk about that repentance and the joy in heaven. And then the prodigal son story is given about the two sons of the father, people who were born into the family. You know, we, I relate this to being born again. And the one son takes his inheritance and he wastes it and spends it in riotous living and, and you know, blows it all. But then he comes to his senses and he repents, he changes his mind, he, changed, he turns from his wickedness and the, and the riotous living that he was doing, and he decides to come back to his father's house. And he wants to, he comes back to do what's right. And wasn't his father really happy to see him? And he, you know, and he killed the fatted calf and they threw this great big party. And then did they do that for his brother that was the whole time doing the right thing? No. But there's, there's this excitement and joy because, hey, this guy came back. Now, the one who was doing right the whole time, he's earning himself rewards anyways. He's, he had that inheritance. He, he was earning, getting the whole thing. The other one wasted it, but there was still a lot of joy for him coming back. Okay? So when we see this repentance, again, this isn't saying you have to turn from what in order to go to heaven, in order to be saved, for your soul to be saved. No, no mentions of that. Luke 16, verse 30, and he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one... If one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. Talking about this is the story of, the, of the, the beggar and the rich man, right? Lazarus and the rich man. The, and the rich man went, goes to hell and Lazarus goes to heaven. And they're, they're having this, this, this conversation. And he's saying, look, send, some, send Lazarus back to, to warn my family, to warn my brothers. I don't want them to come to this place. And he's, he's arguing here with Abraham saying, look, if someone came back from the dead, they will believe. They will change their mind. And he says, and Abraham basically says, no, you know, they have Abraham and the prophets, your, your Moses, excuse me, Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. So if they don't hear them, they won't believe even if someone does come back from the dead. So that's another usage of the word repent. And again, no reference to sins and doing what's right in that verse, talking about them not going to hell. None at all. You can't prove to me that that's talking about you have to repent of your sins to be saved. You do have to repent. He's saying, I want them to repent, but he doesn't say you have to start living a good life. Luke 6, or excuse me, 17. I think I'm going to finish through the book of Luke and then pick up tonight because there's still, there's still a bunch of verses <clears throat> to go over. But there's one, we're going to go to... I'm going to read these for you. Turn, if you would, to Jonah chapter 3. And we're going to, I think I'm going to hit this in this morning and tonight's service just in case someone's not here. Turn to the book of Jonah 
in chapter 3. Jonah's in the minor prophets. So after everyone pretty much knows where the book of Psalms is and Proverbs, you go past those, you have Isaiah, Ezekiel, or Isaiah Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and then you get into the minor prophets. <coughs> Yes. It's a short book. Jonah. It's between Obadiah and Micah. Just because you probably know where Obadiah is in Micah, right? So if you're flipping through, it's 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 right in the middle of all the all those uh, all the minor prophets there. But um, I'm going to read for you, finishing up on, in the New Testament here in the Gospels at least, Luke 17, verse 3 says, Take heed to yourselves. If thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him, and if he repent, forgive him. Okay, this is obviously talking about our relationship with other people. This isn't talking about our salvation at all. It's saying if someone does you wrong, but then he changes, he does what's right by you, forgive him. Okay, Luke uh, verse 4. And if he trespass against thee seven times in a day, and seven times in a day, turn again to thee, saying, I repent, thou shalt forgive him. He's saying every time he does you wrong, and he comes back and says, look, I'm sorry, I, you know, I, I, I won't do that again, I'm not, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to do what's right now. We need to forgive that person. It's not talking about our eternal salvation. This is talking about our, our relationship with other people. And then Luke 24, verse 47 says, in that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. So, repentance should be preached, absolutely. Remission of sins is the forgiving of sins, right? It's the taking away of your sins. That's what remission is. So, he's saying repentance and the taking away of your sins should be preached. Okay, yes, repentance should be preached. The correct repentance with the correct context. If you're talking about salvation, it's believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. Changing what you believe. Changing in, from believing in Allah. Changing and believing from Buddhism. Changing and believing from an idol. Changing what you believe to believing on Christ for salvation. And you could preach repentance of, hey, Christian, do what's right. Stop watching that TV. Stop, stop you know, Get it in all these sins. Stop doing the, you know, all this stuff that, that's, that you shouldn't be doing as a Christian. Do what's right. That repentance. I had you turn to Jonah. We're going to get into the rest of these verses tonight. But in Jonah chapter 3. When people say... You need to turn from your sins to be saved. That is a works-based salvation. I've heard people say, oh, you just don't understand what they're saying. You're, it's just, you're just misunderstanding. No, look. If you say you have to turn from your sins to be saved, that is a works-based salvation. The Bible says, for by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Look, we all agree that the Bible says our works have nothing to do with our salvation. And people try to tell you that you have to repent of your sins, but somehow that's not works. Look at Jonah chapter 3. We're going to start reading in verse number 8. Now, this was referenced earlier when we read about Jesus Christ when he says, you know, they, the, the people, the men of Nineveh repented when Jonah came and preached. He says, behold, a greater than Jonah is here. So he was using this city of Nineveh as an example of people who repented. Hey, Jonah came and that was his whole mission. God sent Jonah to preach unto the people of Nineveh because they were doing wickedness. And God said, I want you to preach. And he disobeyed God and he got swallowed by the whale and all, you know, that whole story that we love telling our kids. But the whale spits him out and God says, look, you still need to go and preach that message. It was a negative message saying, look, God's going to destroy the city. God's going God's to kill everybody here in 40 days. And he preached that negative message to Nineveh. They took it to heart. They said, wow. They believed Jonah. And then what they do? They repented in sackcloth and ashes, which means they, got, they were mourning, they were sad, they were saying, God, you know, we're really sorry, we're going to change, we're going to do all this stuff, right? And then 
God didn't destroy their city as a result of that. The city did not get judgment. Look at Jonah chapter 3. At the end here, we're going to read in verse number 8. This was the, the king's decree, but let, every, let, let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God. Yea, let them turn every one from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hands. So what are we seeing here? A perfect example of what some people are teaching you have to do to be saved because it's extreme sorrow. It's mourning. It's sackcloth. It's ashes. It says turning from his evil way. Stop, stop the violence. Stop doing all of this sin. Right? This is what they're doing in, in, the, in the city of Nineveh. Verse 9, who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away from his fierce anger that we perish not? So he's saying the reason why we're doing this is because maybe God will repent. Maybe God will turn away from his anger. Maybe God will see what we're doing and have mercy on us. And look at what it says in verse number 10. And God saw their works. What were they doing? They were sad. They were mourning and they were, they, were, they were stopping their sin. They were turning from their wicked ways. They were turning from their sins. And God saw their works that they turned from their evil way. The Bible defines turning from your evil way, turning from your sins as works in Jonah 3.10. God saw their works that they turned from their evil way. If you have to turn from your evil way in order to be saved, then admit it. You believe in a works salvation because that's what God called it when Nineveh turned from their evil way. He saw their works. Turning from your sins is not a requirement for salvation. And these Ray Comfort heretics that are out there telling everyone they have to turn from their sins and be saved are, are liars and they're damning people to hell because it's a false gospel and they need to be accursed as Galatians 1 says. And God saw their works that they turned from their evil and God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them and he did it not. God changed his mind. Another great example of that word repent. God repenting. He changed his mind. Was God sad? when he changed his mind, deciding not to destroy Nineveh? Was God sinning? No. But he repented. He sure did repent. It had nothing to do with turning from sin. Do you need to repent to be saved? Yeah. Do you need to turn from your sin to be saved? No. Should you turn from your sins? Daily. Yes. Yes. That would be great works. Obedience to God's law is works. Keeping His commandments is works. Not doing violence to people is works because you're obeying God's commandments. Faith is not of works. Faith is what saves us and the faith is where we change what we believe when we're from being unsaved to saved. That, that's the repentance that takes place is Hey, before you weren't trusting in Christ with all of your heart for salvation. But when you heard the gospel and changed your mind and said, you know what, I believe this to be true. That's the repentance necessary for our salvation. Come back tonight if you want. We're going to go through the rest of the, the verses in the New Testament because I don't, I don't want there to be any question about this. There's, there's a few other good, good sections where people will try to turn to and try to teach that you must turn from your sins and be saved. We're going to go through the rest of those tonight, but I'm also going to try to, to get into repentance that we do need to do as far as turning from our sins and the, what the Bible teaches about that as well with the remainder of the, of the portion of the sermon tonight. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your free gift of salvation, dear God. We thank you that we don't have to work for it, that we don't have to turn from all our sins because, Lord, I haven't turned from all of my sins and if I had to turn from all my sins and be saved, I'd still be lost. 
We thank you for that free gift, for, for giving us the truth and, and the, the requirement for our salvation of our souls is, is believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, I accepted that free gift a long time ago and I thank you for it. And I know everybody here that's accepted that gift is thankful for that gift. Lord, and, and we do want to do what's right. We do want to do good works. We want to do works that are pleasing in your sight, dear God. We want to turn from our sins. We want to turn from all that wickedness, dear Lord, in order to serve you better and for you to be pleased with us. But when we do it, we're not trusting in that for our salvation, dear Lord. And, and we thank you for all the clear teachings from the Bible. Help us not to be deceived by false prophets, dear Lord. Help us not to get sucked into a false gospel, but that we could remain crystal clear on what you actually are saying and teaching in your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.